The Dellenbach Global Leadership Award is presented to individuals who have made an outstanding contribution to Christian higher education through scholarship, writing, and public influence. The CCCU established this award in 2006 in honor of John R. Dellenbach, a former U.S. congressman and a CCCU president. This evening's award recipient joins former award winners, including Oz Guinness, Karen Longman, David Dockery, and Alistair McGrath, to name a few. All of those leaders had work that had remarkable impact on Christian higher education. I've asked Michael Lindsay of Taylor University to give remarks from a scholar and president's point of view about what makes Andy Crouch so incredibly deserving of this award. Michael. So it's a great honor to be able to pay tribute this evening to my good friend Andy Crouch. No doubt you're aware of him as a prolific author, thinker, and uh, speaker. Andy's uh, Culture Making has to be the most popular book I assigned in my sociology classes. And uh, I agree that Strong and Weak and uh, Playing God are some of the most thoughtful articulations of the relationship between the gospel and thinking about issues of power and leadership. His more recent works, uh, The TechWise Family and The Life We're Looking For, have helped us to think more deeply about relationships and the place of technology in our modern world. New York Times columnist uh, David Brooks has a new book that's come out, and in it, he has extolled Andy's skill as an engaged listener. And uh, I can personally attest to the ways that Andy responds when we talk. He uses what we might call groans of affirmation <laughs> with loud hmms and yeses. I heard it while he was sitting here. Uh, it's like he's talking back to the preacher in church, even if you're just across the table from him having coffee. And he's a masterful communicator, one who's able to distill really complex ideas in the academy and to make them accessible to a very diverse uh, audience. He does this as a gifted storyteller and with the occasional alliterative flourish that would make even the Baptist preachers in us proud. <laughs> Although he identifies more with Puritan Boston, where he spent years in campus ministry, at Harvard, then Quaker Philadelphia, where uh, he now lives um, because uh, his family is there. I think even E. Digby Baltzell, who wrote that great work of Puritan Boston and Quaker Philadelphia, would be impressed with Andy's ability to make connections with people from all over the world, wherever he happens to be. Beyond his contributions as a writer, a thinker, a creator, and a communicator, Andy has influenced Christian higher education through his godly example for over 25 years. He and I met a number of years ago through an organization that brought different folks together. And through that, we developed sort of a beginning relationship. I was living in Princeton, New Jersey. He was living in Swarthmore, Pennsylvania. His wife, Catherine, is here. And Catherine is a celebrated faculty member and department chair of the physics department at Swarthmore. And um, so we got to be friends. And then even though we have never lived in the same city uh, at the same time, we made a commitment for a number of years that we would see each other every single month. And so we just found a way to connect one way or another. And that really was a, a, a time of deepening our friendship. Through that, I got to know Andy's kids, Timothy and Amy, and to be able to see the great godly young people that they have become, which is a wonderful testimony to the household of faith that Catherine and Andy have built and represented. So Andy has been a generous supporter to Christian higher education. Uh, I was a beneficiary of that when I was at Gordon. And his support has buoyed my spirits in more ways than he could possibly know. I've seen Andy's example as a faithful friend in a number of contexts. And I could tell you lots of great accolades about Andy. But tonight, I would just tell you about three moments of great faithfulness that made an impression on me and I think represent the spirit of why Andy is receiving the Dellenbach Award tonight. The day after my wife and I received the devastating news that our oldest child, our only child at the time, Elizabeth, had a very rare genetic disorder, I was actually out doing dissertation research. I was attending a conference being held in Colorado and uh, I was staying at the dumpy Holiday Inn down the street. Andy was staying at the very fancy uh, conference hotel because he was there to lead worship. Andy's not only a great speaker, he's also a very talented classical musician. 
And we just happened to bump into each other in the lobby. And in a you know, casual moment, Andy just said, Michael, you know, how are you doing? And in a moment of, um, I guess I'd say, spontaneous vulnerability that actually surprised both of us, I just fell apart in the lobby of that hotel. And I began weeping. And uh, Andy and I were not super close at this point, but he could tell I needed a friend. And so he said, hey, I've got an extra bed in my room. Why don't you just come and stay with me and we'll hang out and maybe you can tell me more about what's going on. That was a very generous act of kindness that nobody knew about, but it speaks to Andy's character. He may be a personality on a stage, but he is also a man of great integrity who shows kindness in the little things. And in that way, I think he's a great example of what we seek to see in all of our students, in all of our graduates. A few years later, Andy and I worked on a small venture to draw some funders and thought leaders to help support what we would describe as the investment in the evangelical mind. It was a fledgling idea that we both cared a great deal about, and eventually it started a program that would help cultivate the next generation of Christian public intellectuals. And it's a great program. It's still being curated by the Veritas Forum. And it was a lot of fun. Like most men, we bonded over the process of working on something together. And through that, it was really gratifying to see how this nascent idea began to really make a difference in the lives of these faculty members, many of them being CCCU institutional faculty as well. Then, about 10 years ago, while I was serving as the president of Gordon College, my institution came under the limelight of some institutions and organizations that were really opposing Gordon's position on a couple of different issues. And it was a very, very, very challenging season. By far the most difficult thing I've ever gone through professionally in my life. One day, a major publication invited a community leader in our area to write an op-ed basically in defense of our institution. This community leader called me and said, hey, I'd be happy to put my name to this, but I do not have the time to get this done, so you would need to ghostwrite it if it's going to take place. I worked on it very hard for about 24 hours and got it to be as good as I possibly could, but I knew it was far from hitting the mark, and I did not know what to do. It was a Sunday afternoon, and the deadline was quick approaching. Finally, Rebecca, my wife, said, why don't you call Andy and see if he'd be willing to help? I said, I don't even know where he is, honey. And she said, well, he's a friend, and I bet he would be willing to help if he can. So I called Andy, I told him my situation, I emailed him this essay I had been working on, and then two hours later, he emailed it back and had made it flawless and perfect. <laughs> and uh, it was a really big break for us because the publication did actually run that particular piece and it began to turn the narrative in very helpful ways. A few weeks later, I ran into Andy and I was sort of recounting that frantic Sunday afternoon and I asked him about, you know, what was he doing that day? It turns out he and Catherine were driving back to Philadelphia after uh, picking up their son at a music camp at Oberlin in Ohio. They were literally driving down the interstate. Andy understood the time pressure I was facing, so they pulled over to a rest area, and the kids and Catherine walked around for 90 minutes while Andy apparently worked on his laptop in the back of their car. Now, if that is not a faithful friend, I don't know what is. <laughs> These are just three individual vignettes where I've seen my friend Andy Crouch embody the kind of character that I think we all want to see in folks who receive these kind of recognitions and awards. I have hiked with Andy in Acadia National Park, and I've hung out with him on a boat off the Baja Peninsula. And everywhere in between, I have seen him speak in front of thousands of people and been in very intimate conversations. It's the same Andy in all of those circumstances. And because he is not only a great thought leader and a creator, a musician, a speaker, but also a godly example for me as his friend, it's a great privilege to be able to see somebody succeed in something so important to be a representative of what we hope all of our graduates would embody. And so it's a great honor to be able to recognize my friend, Andy Crouch.
Everyone is made in the image of God, a blessing which carries incredible responsibility. We are called to reflect God in the ways we engage with culture, wield power, and forge connections with others. Andy Crouch has relentlessly explored these questions with wisdom and compassion. His work has transformed hearts and shaped culture. In recognition of his sharp insights, deep wisdom, and faithful leadership, we are honored to present Andy Crouch with this award. In 2008, Andy's groundbreaking book, Culture Making, reminded us that we are not simply consumers of culture, nor are we mere combatants in culture wars. Instead, as image bearers of God, we are called to create culture. Andy is an incredible model in this process. Through five published books, articles featured in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and Time, and speaking engagements, Andy does not merely comment on culture. He creates it. His work kickstarts deep cultural conversations, inspires references in Lecrae songs, and guides readers around the world as they seek to live out their faith and flourishing. In education, we care deeply about this work. As Christian colleges and universities, we hope to shape culture through our students. We are raising up generations of image bearers who seek true human flourishing. We are in the business of soul formation and compassionate engagement. Andy models this practice through his servant-hearted leadership at Praxis, where he serves as a teacher and mentor to young Christian entrepreneurs. Like Lindy, who you met tonight, and Ryan, who you are going to meet tomorrow. This Christ-like interest in and love for others makes Andy a staunch advocate of the vulnerable and the marginalized, the widow, the orphan, the stranger. With compassion and God-given insight, he reminds us what it means that every person bears the image of God. And he calls us to recognize that through the way we wield power, the way we use technology, the way we engage with culture matters. Andy, we are grateful to call you a partner, a guide, and a friend in this work. We see the pulse of Christian higher education reflected in your commitment to engaging people's hearts and minds in pursuit of true flourishing in Christ. We are honored to present you with the 2024 John Dellenbach Award. Well, this is extremely embarrassing, but <laughs> also kind of fun, so thank you. I, can I say that yeah. when Shirley called me um, about this possibility, I was extremely embarrassed and thought, can I possibly get out of this? But then I thought of several things. First, I thought of Mary Jane Dellenbach. That's right. Who, uh, who when I met her, uh, John Dellenbach, uh, I believe, uh, was no longer living, but Mary Jane and I served on the Fuller Theological Seminary Board, and she was a person of such extraordinary poise and graciousness and intellect and uh, presence. And I, I just treasured knowing her. Um, and then I thought about all the friends who would be here, um, because I really do count many, many people in this room as friends. Uh, and then I thought about the work you all do that matters so much to me, even if I don't know you personally. And then surely I thought, I cannot say no to Shirley Hoogster because <laughs> I admire you so much. And then at some point I found out that Lindy Cleveland was going to be yes. the Young Alum Award. Yeah. And we have many, we have, every year we have 12 nonprofit fellows and 12 for-profit fellows at Praxis, and we spend a year with them. And we love them all and we have no favorites. That being said, some of them definitely make an extra impression on the whole Praxis team. And you now know a little bit of why, although until you get to know her much better, you'll, you'll never quite realize what a learner Lindy is, like just a continual, relentless learner. We saw this through the whole year we had with her. You will also never find out, I'm not quite sure how to put this, Lindy, how utterly earthy she is. Like she was very, very 
nice tonight in a very appropriate way. <laughs> but like, this is the most just perfectly honest, unfiltered, pro appropriately unfiltered human being, just with utter grace. It's truly extraordinary, and uh, I'm so glad I was here to to witness yes. you get this award, Lindy. We are we at Praxis are very proud of what you're doing. We really believe in it. So anyway, it's a well. We're gift really to be glad with you, you said yes. Gosh, we're really glad you, you said yes. It's a gift. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about your books because that everybody I know most everybody might. But uh, let me say uh, this. Yeah, you've written Culture Making, Playing God, The Tech Wise Family, The Life We've. We're looking for uh, the impact of AI is maybe, uh, and then you're gonna do another uh, book. <laughs> um, so what inspires you to write what you write? Hmm. Um, I am always, well, I'm always trying to pay attention. Uh, I've had a very difficult career in the sense that when I sit on airplanes and people say, what do you do? <laughs> I find it really hard to answer. So for a couple of years, I, I just said, I pay attention. And usually people don't want to talk to you after you say that. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm trying to pay attention to the world in many ways. And, and then I, I notice things that are missing, mm -hmm. I guess, is mm -hmm. the answer. I notice that, I mean, culture making came out of feeling like we were, actually Christians were talking about culture a lot. And we had stock phrases we went to, uh, and they, were, they had, value behind them. Uh, engaging culture was the most common. There's a lot to be said for that. Uh, people talked a lot about worldview. There was a lot to be said for that. And I was like, but something, there's something missing. Yes. Like, I'm sure, not sure engaging is the, like, telos. It's not yeah. the end point. What, right. what, we are engaging unto what, or to what end. And then I wasn't sure that worldview, which is an extremely helpful way to think about how cultures kind of uh, put meaning together and then, and then bury it underground so you don't even realize that it's all there. Um, I thought, but is it just about you know, ideas? Uh, isn't there more to it? So I, I end up feeling like there's something we haven't quite said yet that's almost on the tip of a lot of our tongues, but we haven't found words for it, and I yes. then try to find the words. And then I try to avoid writing a book because I find <laughs> writing books very hard, so it's only when I'm just convinced, no, I think I need to say it, that I commit to doing it. So. You, you have a, an, uh, an incredible ability of finding the intersection between things. Hmm. Uh, the image of God and, and what you're uh, studying. How is it that this observational ability you have brings that clarity to the intersection of things? Oh, goodness. Uh, you said you I, didn't want to know the questions. <laughs> no, we, yes, I did say uh, interviews are terrible if the interviewee knows the questions, so I do not know. I don't know how to directly answer your question because I don't know how to describe mm -hmm. the process. I do know what you have to have to do it. Um, I mean, you, you do need to just cultivate curiosity. Yes. And that word came up earlier, I think, in another context. It's so important just to stay mm -hmm. curious about the world. And I think I temperamentally was that way, but I've tried to stay that way. I think I, uh, this is a slight digression, but in my <laughs> 20s, I sensed that I was becoming cynical and I was Gen X, so it was like in the water of Generation X cynicism. And I thought, I cannot let that happen. And I remember going through a kind of process of prayer and even asked some other people to pray that I would just not be cynical. And I, I, I actually look at that decision not mm. to become cynical, which is basically to make up your mind about the world in a way, in a negative direction. And that helped, helped me, I think, just stay curious. And then, so then the other thing is you have to be... Um, I mean, there's two things you have to have a horror of as a writer, and so you have to have a horror of sentimentality, which okay. is unearned emotion, okay. and you have to have a horror of cliche, okay. which is overly familiar truth. Mm. And if you never let yourself say the cliched thing, then you have to say something else, or you can stay silent, which perhaps is preferable most of the time, but if you need to like, put words to something, you gotta, keep going until you find the unfamiliar truth. And it's always at some intersection with something else. So I don't yeah, know. Yeah, that, that's, that's the, best the best intersection, the unfamiliar truth, right? And um, yeah. you, you, you set things up that helps the rest of us think because of what you've written. And so when you wrote the book, Playing God, you wanted to talk to us about power. Right. And, and how did that come about and why did it come about? <sighs> 
thank you for bringing up my favorite and least selling book. I'm very, very <laughs> grateful. Uh, if everyone here goes out and buys a copy, it will double the sales. Uh, but uh, I still believe in it because what it was very much the sense that something was missing. I mean, um, power is an inescapable reality in human, all human relationships. Uh, especially three or more, in a way. Where three or more gathered, power is in the room. Um, and, uh, and, and actually, speaking of cynicism, here was the thing that really got me working on that book. It was the sense that there was a kind of relentless, damaging cynicism about power. Yeah. That, uh, that Christians not least, though not only Christians, were afflicted with. That, and the problem is, because you can't get rid of it, if you decide it's so tainted by corruption that we can't have it, and by the way, when you start writing a book about power, do you know what everyone says to you? They say, hey, have you heard that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely? <laughs> I'm like, yes, I have heard that. In fact, it's the only thing I've ever heard anyone say about power because it's so well known, you know. Um, and if you, if you actually come to believe that, and, and I, I mean, this is extremely relevant to us in this room, obviously, because we all have stepped, uh, or those of us who are presidents in this room, have stepped into positions of power. And if you believe that like, there's a linear relationship between the amount of power you have and, and the amount of corruption you partake in, you will do everything you can to avoid power, and if you have it, you will pretend you don't have it. And that's the most dangerous thing to do with power. And it struck me, and then Jesus, people would say this other thing. They would say, well, Jesus uh, always um, you know, gave up power. Jesus didn't, sometimes you would hear versions of, like Jesus didn't have power, Jesus avoided power. And it's certainly true that Jesus' own power and his conception of his power was very different from Octavian's understanding of power, Augustus Caesar's understanding of power. Um, but Jesus acts with utter awareness and um, serenity, you might say, about the power he's been yes. given. And yes. when he does, flourishing happens. Yes. And that was, and so it was the negative thing. We've gotten so cynical about this that we can't even tell the truth about our own possession of it. Plus, when Jesus acted with his God-given power, which is different in kind and degree from ours, he brought flourishing into the world. Mm -hmm. and, and the most amazing example of this is John uh, 15. John 13, at the beginning of the upper room scene in John, where Jesus washes the disciples' feet. And on the one hand, he's acting as this incredible servant in a very, very distressing way, given his position in that hierarchical society. And yet, through the whole thing are the most clear expressions of power in the whole of the Gospels. You call me Master and Lord, uh, and you are right, for that is what I am. Or when Peter's like, Master, you'll never wash my feet, and Jesus is like, oh, no, I am going to wash your feet. And <laughs> yes, in, in fact, he does. Like, he just, he's unabashed about the fact that he has power, but it's all being used to wash the feet of yes. his disciples. Yes. And I thought, eh, got to write about it. I think we should go bite the book. <laughs> <laughs> University Press will be so grateful. <laughs> So the tech, no. the tech wise uh, family, go ahead. Okay, well, I will also say, I, I don't really care how many copies it sells. What has been very encouraging, I, I know a number of my friends here have read it and, and have given me really beautiful stories of how it got conversation started. And I really don't care how many people were, uh, buy it. I do care that the right people read it. Mm. And, and, uh, and I think that has happened as much as I ever hoped, actually. So you know, it doesn't I don't feel really bad. matter, actually, that, to that point, if one of the right people read it, and that's who you wrote it for. I mean, that would be worth it, right then and there, maybe. John and Ozzy was laughing at me because he heard me say this a few months ago. I finished my last book, which is which is framed or talks in the middle and at the end about this little community gathered around Paul as he's fi finishing writing the letters of the Romans. And I said to Paul, I said to John and a few other friends, you know, if I really believed in my next book, I would make one copy of it and give it to one friend and say, take this to a community that this will help. <laughs> Instead of doing this whole publishing thing where you have to go on a book tour and do podcasts and social media. I mean, what Paul does is he gave the letter to Phoebe and he's like, I think the church in Rome needs to read this. Mm -hmm. And Phoebe got on a boat and took it to Rome. And, and then they were like, this is worth copying, right? <laughs> and we should probably make an extra, right? <laughs> Oh. <laughs> uh.
He didn't have to be on Twitter. He didn't have to be on Instagram. So I, I am seriously thinking with the next book, like I might just make one copy and give it to one friend. Just see what happens. Well, that brings us to technology. Okay. <laughs> All right, so the TechWise family, uh, what was the impetus for that? That was an invitation, came out of the blue from my friend David Kinneman, who is right there. Um, and he and um, uh, his colleagues uh, came to me and said, you know, we're working on a, a series of small books. I, I was intrigued at the small book idea because Playing God is my largest book and my least selling book. <laughs> and then I had written Strong and Weak, which is a small book and is one of my best selling books. I was like, there, there is a pattern here. There's an inverse <laughs> correlation. So I said, we, we don't need a big book, but we need a, a practical book for families mm -hmm. about technology. And I had never thought about writing this, but I became persuaded. I, I will tell you what really persuaded me. I would speak in various settings. And I would talk about the fact that in our home, um, until our kids were dub in double digits, uh, Catherine and I didn't have a television. And, after, and I would often just mention this in the course of some other primary point. And afterwards, in, not infrequently, there would be a, a line several young couples deep of like 30 year old beginning to be parents who are like, wait, tell us more about how you didn't have a TV when your kids were small. And I sensed this hunger, which now this was like 2015, 2016. We now, I mean, now we have all the data and we've got just so yes. much evidence that the glowing rectangles are doing so much damage. But, but there was this incipient sense like there's something not right and people are adrift and, and our, our parents didn't have to deal with it, you know, all that generational kind of question of we're, we're dealing with things that we don't have any scripts for as a culture. So I said yes, and then I, read, I went and read Marie Kondo's book, uh, The Simple Pleasures of Tidying Up, or whatever it is, because it's a very <laughs> short book that sold a lot of copies. I was like, okay, let's see if we can do this, but for technology and family life. And, uh, and it, it has connected in a way I never imagined, because I, when I finished it, I thought, this is too radical. The things I'm asking people to do are, like, Americans will not do this. Um, and, and to be fair, Americans are not doing the things I recommended. <laughs> and most people who read the book don't do the things I recommend. But they do want to read the book. Like, people actually know something's really wrong yes. and that we need to make a change. And then, you know, you tell them what you need to do to make a change. They're like, that's too hard, but thank you for the book. So, <laughs> it, but it's been, it's been very encouraging, actually. We, we are going to see... Do, do not, trees do not grow to the sky. Trend, the trend is not always your friend. Trends create counter trends. We are going to see, it, I don't know, you, I can't predict the future, I, but I believe there is a tide turning um, in this heedless incorporation of technology into formative environments, the three primary formative environments being home, church, and school. Mm. Uh, and I think it's just clear to me, especially in the home, uh, like Gen Z so-called is not going to have this heedless embrace of technology in their homes or in their relationships the way that, um, that happened for a while. Um, well, for your, your lips to God's ears, may it be so. Yeah, I yeah. pray, I pray yeah. it's so. But I, I see signs that it's really changing. Now I could say something like, hey, your book is not making the impact you want, but that's just a lead in mm. because you're writing a book about impact. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm on the journey to write another book, I think. Um, I really do put this off as long as possible, so I do want to make sure that I have the right idea. But, uh, and I've been writing about this word even back to culture making, but I, I've realized there's more to say. Um, I am writing a book about how to make a meaningful difference in the world, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, when we say, what was the impact of that? I think what we are using that word to mean is a meaningful difference, a positive, meaningful difference. And so if you, know, if you have you know, impact task forces or whatever at your institutions or your board chair says, well, what's the impact of this? Uh, I think that's a good question, a proper question. I'm not sure it's the right metaphor. Hmm. Insofar as impact is fundamentally a metaphor of a large amount of force over a small amount of time and is most naturally applied to things like asteroids impacting the planet, right? Like, an asteroid, if should, God forbid, another one hit us like it hit the dinosaurs, it will, it will have an impact. <laughs> but we will be in a lot of trouble. And impact is very, very close to violence. Oh. Violence is impactful. 
Violence often involves literal impact, but it always involves a concentration of force greater than a system can bear, whether it's the, a human body, a human mind-soul complex, a family, an organization. It's, and it, it's when someone tries to get a very large result in a very small amount of time. And when you put it that way, I do not think we want to have impact. And uh, just way one more thread of this. I've been thinking about like, so what do you need to have a, re if you are serious about having impact in our world, so you need a lot of force and you want it to happen fast. I think there's only three durable sources of the kind of force you need to really change the world. I'm not talking about something on a slogan. I'm talking about actual measurable effect over a short amount of time. And they are the power of the state to coerce, mm -hmm. because the state claims for itself the right, with violence if necessary, or force if necessary, to make you do something you don't want to do. Mm -hmm. If we could get a hold of that, we could change things very fast. Mm -hmm. The power of money to compel creative action. If I pay you a lot of money, uh, it'll actually unlock capacities in you that you might not have unlocked or mm -hmm. might have put to something else. And then I, the third is like the power of charisma to fascinate. Uh, mm -hmm. There are people who just, if they walk in a room, I am not one of these people, uh, but if they walk in a room, they just, they light up the room, they light up the screens, mm -hmm. and, you know, if George Clooney walked in right now, this conversation would become very uninteresting. It's just the <laughs> honest truth, even at his advanced age. I'm sure there's a more relevant, younger star I should be using, but, um, and Augustus Caesar had all three. Oh. So Augustus Caesar obviously commanded this massive army right. to the bounds of the empire. Augustus Caesar minted the coins. He had whatever level of money he wanted. And what did he put on the coins? The first meme, the first icon, the only image in Judea you ever would have seen of a human face because the Jews following the commandment not to make graven images never made images of human beings. The only face you would have, other than the faces of your neighbors, the only face you would know just from its representation was the face of Octavian. Jesus, uh, Augustus Caesar had, had the three things all locked up on one guy and the system that supported him. And Jesus of Nazareth had none. No state power to coerce. In fact, obviously, ultimately a victim of state power. No money to speak of. Judas carried the money bag. <laughs> And he had no form or appearance that we should desire him. Mm. Nothing that we should regard him. Mm. He looked like a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. And the movement Jesus mm. led and the power, the beneficial power that Jesus unlocked that is literally the reason we're in the room today, grew and grew and grew. And the power of Octavian Augustus Caesar, uh, very impressive, still also with us in some ways, but far less consequential. So which kind do we want? So this next book is like, how do you get that other, how do you make that other kind of change? Wow. That's the, the where we're going. Um, Andy, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for thank the you. conversation we just had. It uh, is a creative, generous, artistic way in which to think. Hmm. Um, and we're grateful for you. Thank you.